Welcome everybody to our first Rapid Fire Grand Rounds presentation. Today we have a special treat. We have all of our winners from our evidence-based practice and research um, conference presenting their excellent work. So before we get into their presentations, um, I just want to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. So first, I'm sure all of you want your CEs. To get your CEs, you will have to complete the evaluation. Karen, can you click to it? The evaluation is located on the nursing website. And you can just follow. It's under the research and evidence-based practice. And you'll find the link oh, right there. So what we have, we have iPads that we're going to pass around at the end where you can actually complete your evaluation here. If you have to get back up to your units, all of you who signed in will be getting this link sent to you in the email. So um, that should make it a bit easier for you. Um, the evaluation form, it's a two-part form. It's um, first of all, there's a confidential um, evaluation, and then you'll sign in your name so you, we can give you your CEs. That's the second portion of the form. Um, at the end of this session, I hope you do stick around. We'll be doing the evals, and then also we'll have a raffle for all of you who put in the raffle tickets. If you didn't get any raffle tickets, just see Karen right towards the end. So with that, um, I just want to take a couple minutes to introduce our first speaker. Ooh. Sorry, this is a little sensitive. All right, so why are we all here today? We're here to learn about nurses leading change. How many in the room are familiar with the IOM Future of Nursing report? Quite a number of us. The basic gist of the report is that nurses are in the perfect opportunity, perfect forum to lead the healthcare transformations that need to happen. We should be at the table. And to take to do that, what we really need is frontline nurses, just like the nurses here who are going to present to you, really um, taking it upon themselves to make a difference in practice. And so we're going to give you an example of the different practices, changes that all of these nurses have um, made. So with that, our first presenter is Janelle Lehman Lurill, mm -hmm. and she's presenting on um, her, her project, Making Evidence-Based Practice and Nursing Research Attractive, an Educational Approach to Increasing Nursing Engagement. So I'm Janelle Lehman Laurel. I'm from Huntington Hospital in Pasadena, California. I am. I have my RN, my Master's in Nursing from University of Phoenix, and my um, certification in my specialty area, which is maternal newborn nursing. Um, for disclosures, I have no financial relationships with commercial interests. So um, Huntington Hospital is a magnet facility. Um, this is really great because when we started our push for magnet, um, we, did, we developed our evidence-based practice and nursing research council in 2009. Um, I joined this council in 2010. I was the co-chair in 2013 and the chair in 2014, and I'm still a member. Um, so in 2010, we also did an assessment of our EBP projects in nursing research at Huntington Hospital and found there were no EBP projects being tracked and only one research project completed. So because of that, our council decided that we needed to start a nursing engagement campaign. Um, we needed to improve those numbers and teach our nurses about evidence-based practice. Um, so we called this our evidence-based practice or EBP nursing research engagement campaign. Um, this is uh, at first, um, there were three basic elements, and we decided to introduce evidence-based practice in kind of a more um, user-friendly media. So we, we wanted to humor people a little bit, so we developed a computer-based learning module with talking avatars, the video is embedded, and these cartoon-like people got up and started talking about evidence-based practice and the Iowa model, and they were kind of funny, and they just kind of introduced the Iowa model and gave explain the algorithm, which can be pretty daunting, and we hoped with this first introduction that people would get more interested because it was had the humor element. 
but um, engagement was still low. So we also, we went to the UBC, our unit-based council meetings, and we, we thought that because the nurses were already on the UBCs that they would be more engaged already and committed to making a positive change in their environment. Um, we went to these meetings and we just gave a more comprehensive PowerPoint presentation and talked about what evidence-based practice was and the resources they had available to help them if they wanted to have a project. We also got ideas from them about what projects they could do. And then we decided then that we needed to develop a, a resource for, for the nurses, like an online resource. So with the help of our really awesome librarians at Huntington Hospital, we developed our intranet site and we called it the Nursing Research Center. And on that site, um, we have an EBP toolkit and links to different research. And we, it's also internal and external. So um, you can visit the site from anywhere. It's on the, it has its own URL. So as a result, of this campaign. Um, our EBP projects increased from zero in 2010 to four in 2014. And I know there's more going on right now in 2015. I just don't have those numbers yet. Our nurse-led research studies increased from one in 2010 to nine but at the end of 2014. And these are not all completed. I think we had two, or two that were actually completed at this time. Our Nursing Research Center page hits and we developed this in 2012. So in the first year, we had 1,933 hits, which increased to 5,498 hits in 2014. We also had inquiries from around the world, including places like Jordan, um, which is kind of interesting. So in conclusion, um, we believe our campaign um, that used various educational materials and different learning styles was effective. Uh, our nurses now have the no not just knowledge, but the resources to conduct their own projects, and they know where to go if they need help or where to get their projects started. We also have mentors available um, on our, um, our Evidence-Based Practice Council um, and the website, yeah. But we also have people that will help them. Uh, the thing about you know this campaign is education, I mean, Engagement is ongoing. It's really hard to keep people engaged, especially when there's so many changes going on. Um, it's hard to keep people engaged in saying this is evidence-based practice. So one of the takeaways I got from this project is that you know, you've got to get out there yourself and keep people engaged. And it's very hard, but when you show your enthusiasm, you know, people tend to follow. And you know, trust me, everyone I work with knows about evidence-based practice, and they know I'm all about it. So. Um, I'm very fortunate that our new nurses coming out of nursing school right now, it's, it's not as hard to get them engaged in evidence-based practice because our nursing schools are doing a great job in teaching our, our new nurses about evidence-based practice. The hard part is getting the nurses, the older nurses, that they're going to be retiring maybe in a few years, and they're like, why would I want to do that for? <laughs> I just want to get out of here. And there's a lot of negativity in that area because you know a lot of nurses just want to go and do their job and not care. But, yeah, 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 you're right. I'm the evidence-based practice um, champion. We call ourselves champions. So um, the, the one thing, you know, I like to say is engagement is like a wave. So if we started here and I said, let's get up and do the wave. Do the wave. It's like we're at the stadium robbing the wave. Go around, go around, get up, get up. Okay, so if I wouldn't have gone out there and told you to do the wave, we would probably have done it. So. <laughs> that, that's my point. <laughs> so that's kind of my conclusion right there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, your enthusiasm is definitely contagious. So um, I think all of us can take that back to our units. Next we have Karen Salvador. She's from NPH, and she will be presenting her project, Development of a Seclusion and Restraint Documentation Resource Nurse Program in the Inpatient Psychiatric Setting. Um, 
Uh, good afternoon. So um, I'm one of the night shift nurses at NPH, and this uh, project was originally developed. Oh, oops. <laughs> was originally developed um, with the help of my mentor, Candice Whiting, who also, or Kelly, who happens to be our performance improvement director. So um, I don't have any relevant financial relationships with commercial interests. I think I pressed the wrong button. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, seclusion and restraints use uh, presents a significant patient safety risk. To minimize these risks, seclusion and restraint standards must be followed and documentation of care provided must be accurate and complete. Overall compliance with seclusion and restraints documentation at our 74-bed acute care psychiatric hospital between January and March the last year was 82%. So the purpose of this project is to improve seclusion and restraint documentation compliance within the inpatient psychiatric setting to 95% or better. Um, in doing so, patients' rights are protected and unnecessary use of seclusion and restraints are avoided. Uh, it's also interesting to add that, um, of course, 95% is our realistic goal, but um, the goal for all of these is 100%. So we developed this peer-to-peer uh, -peer seclusion restraint support program, which is divided, in, which was divided into three main projects. The first one is the um, creation of documentation champions, where. Um, each seclusion and restraint documentation resource nurse um, provides real-time education, um, and one is available, at least one is available in each unit pod per shift. Um, we also um, focused our interventions on minor care connect modifications, um, which includes limiting free texting and providing um, drop-down options for uh, nursing staff and providing acceptable behavioral rationales. So um, the last but not least is, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Last but not the least is provision of the resource enhancements. So um, we developed um, handy badge cards, reference guides for our staff nurses, as well as um, easy to follow flow charts because um, um, in our project, as we were doing it, um, we got feedback that the existing documentations and resources that we have are either a very complicated and or um, like difficult to locate. Um, evaluation data three months post implementation at pilot site 4 West, which is the child adolescent unit of NPH, showed a high overall satisfaction rate among seclusion and restraint documentation champs and clinical nurses receiving assistance. We also have an improvement of seclusion and restraint documentation compliance rate to 98% or better. So. Um, the second to the last um, bar graphs um, from the right um, shows the improvement from when education was initiated. Um, you could see that the RN documentation in, improved from 80%, 75% to 98%. And eventually, when the seclusion and restraint champion um, documentation program was um, was implemented on the first quarter of this year. Um, well, you cannot see, but um, the RN documentation, RN note, and RN forms were all 98% across the board. So um, there was at least significant um, changes as a result. So uh, frontline nurse involvement from a diverse group of clinical nurses is critical to provide insight into root causes of and respective solutions to clinical issues and challenges. The partnership of nurse leaders, educators, researchers, and clinicians is a potent quality improvement tool. Uh, Real-time peer-to-peer support provides a very helpful resource for clinical nurses. So all of three, these three things result in enhanced performance for the nurses. Oh, thank you. That is all. Thank you very much, Karen. Next, we have a few nurses from Santa Monica. Hazel Lau, Patty Sheehan, and Neil... Catch them. 
and they're presenting exceptional patient and families to acceptable, educating nurses to prevent the confrontation. Hi, I'm Patty Sheehan. I'm the CNS for 5MN, and I, we've divided up our presentation in three, so I'll let my technical assistant go ahead here. <laughs> so we have no relevant financial disclosures or relationships with commercial interests. Mm -mm. And then this is the background um, of our project was we were looking um, the patients and family members' uh, over-involvement in care, we have prolonged inpatient stays, delayed escalation of issues to unit management, and nursing burnout, dealing with these long-term patients. So our purpose was to develop a mechanism for nursing staff to address patient or family's disruptive behaviors in patient care settings and provide a tool that will activate the multidisciplinary team for intervention. And our, our hypothesis is that does the implementation of an exceptional family um, and patient algorithm tool increase the nurse's ability to com communicate effectively compared to current nursing practice? One more, sorry. Yeah. All right, so in our pre and post survey, we identified four things that we wanted to assess. The first was how comfortable our nurses felt with dealing with these exceptional patients and family members. The second was we wanted to see if they had adequate knowledge on how to identify behaviors that would identify a patient as exceptional. And the third was that we wanted to see if they felt that they had enough skills on how to deal with these types of patients. And the fourth was that we wanted to know that if they could um, be able to work with multidisciplinary resources for the plan of care for the patients. So in our methods, we had a two-hour um, communication course that was led by our unit director, Vera Lopez. And in this course, we heard an expert from the book, See Me as a Person, and we had an open discussion on how the staff members felt dealing with these patients that we've had over the past couple of years. And we also had a role-playing in which um, we acted out scenarios that we've actually had happen to us on the floor, and our social, our, um, um, what was his position? Um, Tim Thornton, who is our spiritual care manager at Santa Monica, actually helped us with how to communicate effectively with these types of situations. And we also emailed and huddled about the different behaviors and how to initiate the algorithm. And um, we had care conferences with the multidisciplinary team, which included either the unit director, the CNS, the patient, the nurse, or the charge nurse, or a unit director. And all of these meetings were summarized in a logbook that we kept at the nursing station that the other staff members could reference in case they were taking care of that patient afterwards. Um, so this is, uh, these are post-survey uh, results that were uh, essentially kind of done after the education session was completed. Um, as you can kind of see, we had a, or as far as going through the percentages, we, we had a 24% increase in nurses' comfort uh, caring for patients and families with challenging behaviors, 32% increase in nurses feeling as though they have the skills and knowledge to assess and intervene with patients and families displaying challenging or, or disruptive behaviors, 24% increase in nurses' ability to identify interdisciplinary resources um, to use, and then uh, a 30% increase in nurses' ability to um, identify stressful triggers and cope with stressful situations. So. Uh, the educational session was really effective at improving these these four kind of areas, um, and we plan on resurveying uh, before our next education session, which still has not uh, kind of been determined when we're going to roll that out. Um, as far as overall conclusions for our project, uh, nurses feel more empowered and comfortable dealing with exceptional patients. Um, this is primarily because they know that there's a structure in place uh, to help them work with these challenging uh, patients and family members, um, and they know that they're not alone in, in kind of approaching these situations. Um, patient uh, and family concerns are addressed earlier. Um, we're recognizing behaviors um, before they kind of escalate into really kind of aggressive situations or out of control situations. And so we're making modifications to the plan of care, um, you know, in, in addressing these patient family needs um, earlier on and, and really, you know, kind of benefiting uh, them and, and the kind of healthcare staff. Um, the medical plan of care is discussed and the behavioral limitations are established early in the hospitalization. Um, so the medical uh, plan of care and the nursing plan of care is discussed at bedside during these care conferences, um, really kind of, uh, I guess, kind of creating a, I guess a lot of times, you know, patients or family members don't exactly know what's, what's going on or what the plan of care is. So this brings everything to the bedside so that there is, um, uh, what's the best way to describe it? Um, Right, exactly, yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's see-through. Um, so, uh, and then as far as behavioral limitations, we're really trying to kind of uh, encourage nurses to say, 
you know, it's okay um, to say basically these behaviors are not okay. So uh, setting kind of behavioral limitations, letting the know, uh, letting the patients and family members know what behavior is not acceptable. Um, improving, uh, uh, resulted in improved communication between multidisciplinary team members, preventing splitting of staff. During these care conferences, everything is written down, everything is documented. We are working with uh, informatics to, and Care Connect to kind of um, put this in Care Connect so that uh, when we have change of shift or when team members sign off and there's a new team that's taking care of the patient, everything is documented so you can no longer say, uh, or the patient can no longer say, oh, well, this nurse said this or this physician said this because, because, or just because now we have everything documented. So interventions are um, written down, plan of care or modifications of plan of care are written down as well so we know what was discussed, when it was discussed, and what the plan is. Um, as far as the future of the project, um, the plan is to um, continue to pilot it on, um, on 5MN, uh, make changes as needed um, both to the algorithm and uh, specific kind of interventions within, um, within the project. Um, we want to educate all the admitting teams about the project, uh, continue to collect case studies. We're planning on submitting an abstract for um, you know, conferences within the next year, either NTI or some other um, similar conference. Um, and we're going to be disseminating, hopefully disseminating this project throughout the healthcare system once we kind of, um, you know, perfect it as, as best we can. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Walter Chin, who is presenting his research, Efficacy of the U.S. Navy Dive Tables in Treating Decompression Sickness in 103 Cases. This is the... All right. Can everybody hear me? Great. There it is. Okay, so thanks for that nice introduction. Um, I have no financial disclosures to report. And so some brief background on what the decompression sickness is. Essentially, it's, it's gas coming out of solution really fast. Everybody has about two pounds of nitrogen in your body now. It doesn't do anything. We don't know if it does anything. But if someone were to pick you up and toss you really far up to the top of Mount Everest, for example, that gas would come out of solution. It's very similar to, I won't do it, but very similar to this. As soon as you open it, you expose it, gas comes out of solution. And so uh, recreational divers do this. They dive in the ocean and they consume some gas. They compress the inert gas that's in their tissue. And every breath they take in, they start to load more nitrogen into those tissues. And so as they come out of the water column, sometimes that gas comes out of solution. Um, a lot of the times it comes out of solution and it bubbles. And as it bubbles, it causes symptoms. And it's sort of like a severity. A little bubbles might cause a little bit of symptoms. A lot of bubbles cause a lot of symptoms. A lot of those patients come to us. And so uh, in the entire country, there's about 14 million divers. This is not working yet. And California, for obvious reasons, has some of the best diving in the entire world. We have some of the best kelp forests, amazing wrecks, and all sorts of weird-looking things that I have never seen. I dive a lot. I've never seen any of these things. But, uh, but others have. Um, so there's lots of divers. Our health system sees, on average, about 20 cases per year. Um, and so over a 10-year span, we've seen 180-plus cases. The problem is that a lot of the divers we treat, they never get, really get better. And so that was the purpose of doing this study. I wanted to see if the drug we're treating them, recompressing them, was this an adequate drug for these uh, recreational divers? Because that's the question. We're not really meeting the success rates published by the Navy or by other, uh, other labs. And so the study was focused on this, on this specific question how therapeutic were treatment tables five and six and treating the bends. Uh, so that was the first question. The second question is, could I possibly identify predictors of group membership? And it's sort of covered up, but that's, that's the question. And so this is what we did. We wrote up a proposal. This was reviewed and approved by the IRB. Sorry. Oh. And we ended up with 103 cases. And there were some exclusion criteria. Um, the specific variables or predictors I, I focused on, this is based off literature, were demographics, age, gender, height, weight, how deep they were diving, because that's you know, sort of the obvious. If you're diving really deep, maybe you're not going to get as, as good of an outcome. The amount of bottom time, the amount of nitrogen they loaded, the amount of dives, where the symptoms were located, the type of uh, DCS, and uh, the amount of therapy, and the amount of delay. So these guys have symptoms. They come out of the ocean, and they come to us. 
And so this is the result. This is what I found. Uh, when I break down the groups into, into two main groups, people that get completely, you know, 100% better, the drug worked, and then the group that maybe the drug wasn't as effective, these are the predictors that start to, start to tell me uh, something about, about uh, possible uh, answers to why they're not getting better. Um, the group that got better was diving on average plus or minus uh, 20 feet shallower than the group that was not so good. So th the group that ends up with partial relief was diving to 80 feet of seawater plus or minus. There it is. And so we use this to build a, a regression model, a logistic regression model. And these are the odds. The odds of you having complete symptom relief, if you have a change of symptoms within the first 20 minutes, are 5 to 1. If you dive deeper than 60 feet, the odds decrease, which sort of makes sense. And so here's what I think is happening. Um, for the last 50 years, since these U.S. Navy treatment tables were synthesized, everybody has focused on delay. Delay is a, is a predictor of outcome. And so I think that sort of doesn't make sense. It makes sense if you're in the, in the military where everything's very controlled. You have symptoms, you have a chamber, you get to recompress. For the rest of the world, us, uh, you know, divers get the bends, they go home, they drink beer, they wait around, they wait and they sort of simmer in their thoughts of symptoms, and they come to us several, several hours after the fact. So I think that delay is not actually a good predictor. I think the better predictor is how deep they were diving on the very first dive, and that's sort of what I proved with this study. Uh, prospectively, what I hope to do is maybe get better at treating these divers. Uh, early oxygen is key, hydration is key, and I think that uh, the treatment tables uh, aren't built for these guys. I think we should be diving them deeper. Um, and so there's some stuff that we're doing with mixed gas and, and different treatment tables. And so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Next we have Kayla Vanderdrift. She is presenting her work, Trauma to ICU, a Rapid Improvement Project. All right, uh, my name's Kayla. I'm one of the AN1s in the emergency department here in Ronald Reagan. And this is Eric. He's one of our CN2s, hopefully soon to be CN3s. And together we uh, worked on this project, Trauma to ICU, a rapid improvement project. Uh, do we have anything to disclose, Kayla? Sure don't, Eric. Uh, <laughs> Let's move right along then. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about the, the background of what this project was and what, what our goal was? What was our aim? Oh, um, okay. and, and at the very end, look at this. <laughs> this is very sensitive, sorry. Perfect, thank you. No, next slide. Oh, uh, we do one more. Perfect. So, what was the goal of this project? All right, so after we had a bad patient outcome in the ER from a trauma patient um, who was there for an extensive amount of time, our leadership team looked at the boarding time for our critical trauma patients in the waiting in the emergency room. So the trauma patients presenting to us were spending an average of 4.9 hours in the ED prior to transferring to 6ICU. So our overall goal was to decrease the length of stay for adult, adult trauma patients needing ICU level of care. So essentially, we're really good at resuscitating people, but we don't want you sticking around in the ER for five hours, right? Exactly. Okay, good. Uh, so what was some of the methodology that we used to make uh, a change? So Eric and myself met with a few nurses from 6ICU, uh, patient placement, and Marilyn, the trauma coordinator, RN. And we were led uh, by Keith Cox from Performance Excellence. We used the lean methodology to create a root cause analysis. We created a current and future value stream map and then identified and implemented solutions to our barriers. That sounds complicated. <laughs> Um, so everyone's favorite result, or everyone's favorite slide, is always the one that has a graph on it. So let's talk a little bit about the results that came out of this. All right. So um, as you can see, our graph is pretty impressive here. So we just. Uh, <laughs> We decreased the um, length of stay by 55%, so from 4.9 hours to 2.1 or 2.2, and we did this within the first 30 days of implementing our project, and not only did we do that, we have consistently stayed at this average for the past year. That is a huge change. That's impressive. So obviously, I mean, we board patients in the ER all the time. There's not enough room in this hospital. Where, where's that new ICU that we built to get these patients upstairs? Uh, have you guys not been to 9ICU? It's the new boarding place? No? 
Just kidding. Okay, bad joke. So everyone told us that we weren't able to do this project because we had no physical space and it was a waste of time to work on this project. But we found some solutions and a lot of ways to streamline our project. So what were some of those things that we did? So we start with the early charge-to-charge -charge communication between ER and 6ICU. So the 6ICU nurse now gets a uh, page from the trauma pager, so they know if they can expect a patient coming in that's not even in, in the hospital yet. We push for early admission orders from the trauma service while still in the CT scanner. Um, we no longer have to have these patients financially cleared. And by doing all this, we've established a really good rapport between 6ICU, ED, and bed control and the trauma and neurosurgical services, and we've implemented bedside report between our unit and 6ICU. All right. So in conclusion, what's the big picture? What's something that people could take away from if they wanted to do a, a project like this on their, in their department? All right, so lots of big words and little keywords here people love. So by using lean methodology and collaborating with the multidisciplinary team, we were able to create a new process for adult patients requiring ICU level of care. And with this new throughput process, we created a culture change and decreased the length of stay for this population by over 50%. Thank you. So now we're going to have a little Q&A with all of our panelists. Um, if you guys want to just pass that around. Is this on? Okay. All right. So that was a lot of excellent work. Um, a lot of examples of clinical nurses driving change, whether through evidence-based practice, performance improvement, and even research. Um, but change is not without its challenges. So I'd like to know from all of you, what was your biggest challenge in your projects? Um, my biggest challenge, of course, was um, just actually getting the people enthusiastic and engaged, just getting successful. Um, that was really our biggest challenge. And how did you overcome that? Um, our council has a great um, team members, um, and we worked really hard together, and um, everyone on the council is really enthusiastic, and um, we just kept going out and bugging people. That was pretty much it. Great. Perseverance is definitely something that we all need to do when leading these projects. Does anyone else have any other challenges? Um, I think my biggest challenge uh, for the project was that it was my first time. And um, actually the past two years, um, I was in grad school, so it's also translating theory into practice. Great. One more challenge. Um, I think one of our biggest challenges was after we've implemented this uh, getting patients to the ICU, uh, we realized that there's a lot of hiccups, right? So we had some lab issues, we had some blood bank issues, we had some reporting issues. Uh, so it just kind of opened up all these new things that we didn't realize were a problem. Um, so in essence, we had a whole bunch of other little quality improvement projects that went on. But the way that we were able to deal with them, uh, we met 30 days after, we met 60 days after, we met 90 days after, and now we meet as, in, as needed so there's a relationship between 6i and the ED now that definitely wasn't there before. But it was after implementation that we, we started to find uh, all these little hiccups that were happening. Yeah, you hit on a really um, key point of change. And that's not just implementing the change, but how do we sustain it? Sometimes we implement something that's great and then we start to see our outcomes trickle or we see other problems. So what change management um, strategies did you guys find helpful? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I, I think it, yeah, I mean, it follows back up to we, we had open communication, we had mm -hmm. open, uh, we, we had our meetings, uh, staff knew that we were the champions in the ER, they were champions in uh, patient placement, they were champions in the ICU, so when issues did occur, that they all problems went directly there. Um, if we were on shift and there was an issue, it was handled directly at that time, a phone call was made, hey, what's going on, what can we do, how can we make this better? 
Um, we didn't let things linger and fester and, and people get disappointed and, and you know, start resenting the project. And Marilyn Cohen sends us a updated list every week. So we have the times, we have the fallouts, we can follow up on those and see what the delays were and kind of discuss everything as the team together. Great. Now, Karen, I'm going to pick on you because I know a little bit about your project. What challenges did you face in for, um, for West with getting buy-in? Um, you know, I was going to say that surprisingly, it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. Um, I think with the support of the leadership and also the staff, like, honestly, it wasn't, I was expecting something like harder, but actually people were on board, but um, of course, I think we had to really, really instill the sense of urgency mm -hmm. in the project, and also we have to really follow up and really like, you know, I, I approached a lot of the documentation resource nursing champions and like just one to one ask them how it was doing. So, so yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. Why do you think you were surprised? Um, <laughs> It's probably, yeah, well, I should have expected more from nurses, I guess. I probably didn't have a lot of expectations, but coming in, I think it was my first time. So um, so I thought that the staff nurses would be more passive and more resistive, but they're actually pretty cooperative. And maybe they understood the, the need for the project. Yeah. Karen's project, she actually, um, she did a survey beforehand, so her intervention was actually the idea of clinical nurses. So I think that's another reason why they were so engaged, because it really came from them. Um, so that helped when we were implementing. Yeah. So now on to some positive stuff. What was the most rewarding part of your project? Walter? I'll take this one since I ducked the last question. <laughs> I, I, one of the most rewarding parts of the work I did was um, I reaching out to, to, the, to the U.S. Navy and going over the data sets with them. And they were receptive, and they uh, helped me understand some of the modeling I was doing for that. Mm -hmm. And I'd say for our project, um, it was seeing, because this was staff-driven, this was a problem that they had to deal with, but I think... Um, just now, but they're beginning to see that when we implement this multidisciplinary team, it really does affect and control the outbreak that the patients were having. Because we have some patients on our floor for as long as three years that were intubated on a ventilator, and others for two years. So it's a very uh, mixed bag of med surge um, intermediate care patients. So I think it really um, gave the, the majority of our nurses are young, and I think they felt that they had to put up with a lot of these behaviors, and now they realize no. Not as a nurse, I can still be caring, but I can limit set on what I'll accept in the workplace. Wonderful. All right. Do we have any questions from the audience? There's one at Santa Monica. Oh. Oh. Hi, I just had a question for Walter. I'm interested. My father's a veteran of the Navy, and so that I was surprised to see your project. I didn't realize we had a lot of patients that are divers that are coming with the bins and the bins. Are they like, nausea or diarrhea? What is? What do you refer to as bins? Well, the, the, the types of cases we see, the types of cases we see at our ER and then in our chamber, the symptoms are typically minimal: uh, joint pain, uh, some paresthesia, nausea. But we do get we get about twenty cases, and there's. There's a limited number of centers where these patients can go. There's only two in LA County, us and Catalina. So, so now they only come to us. All right, we have a question from Santa Monica. Hi, my name's Rebecca. Hi, how are you? I just want to say great job on your presentations and all the panelists did just a wonderful job on everything. Um, my question actually is directed to um, our colleagues on Five Men. Men. Uh, my name is Rebecca, and I'm uh, from Solid Oncology uh, on Four Southwest here in Santa Monica. And our patient population actually can be very similar to the ones at Five Men, where we constantly have patients that come back, and some of them with with families that could be quite challenging and uh, family dynamics like uh, that might even results you know, in cold grays, 
a lot of you know verbal and physical abuse even. Um, my question is, uh, would you be willing to share your algorithm with uh, your fellow colleagues? And because I think it's it's amazing, and I uh, I was wondering if that would be uh, you know usable for our uh, our colleagues here on for Southwest and also our interdisciplinary team. Um, actually, the plan is right now we are working together with um, our director of medicine. Um, and the hope is it's gotten interest across the health system. So we're still continuing the pilot on our floor. And as we get the last components, we've been meeting monthly with our team of um, psychiatrists, uh, Dr. Levine, Neil, Hazel, myself, uh, case management, social workers. So we're trying to solidify the process and where it will be documented. Um, but yes, that is what the plan is because um, the interest has been quite a bit about this because it seems like a lot of units are dealing similar types of situations with patients. So there's going to be more to come, but yes, we will be sharing. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, now to conclude, I'm going to ask all of the panelists to give everybody in the audience one pearl of wisdom for starting a nursing research, evidence-based practice, or performance improvement project. Say yes, uh, is, and, and say yes to opportunity. Uh, we're all here because we're all obviously leaders within our department, and we all care about uh, our nursing that we do. So this was asked upon me to, hey, Eric, are you interested in, in making trauma patients get upstairs quicker? Yes. OK, go, go here. And, and this is what has bloomed out of it, right? Um, and, and it's this amazing thing, and it's, it's so rewarding deep down personally to, to be able to do this. So um, I just say, say yes to opportunity. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, the one thing that I've learned that, that, uh, that I do now a lot is, is you reach out to people that are considered the experts and uh, don't be afraid to reach out. Email them the less, you know, the least they can say is no. And so that's that's probably the you know the mo one most important thing I've learned. Oh, you just email them. They say no. They say no. They say yes. And they say yes. Uh, I don't know any real pearl other than being one of the old nurses. Um, be willing to work with the young nurses. They have lots of great ideas, and that the, they know things about technology that I will never know. So it made the process uh, a lot simpler. Things that I didn't know how to do, they did. Um, well, I'll, I'll say two things. Uh, first, it's really important to have a good relationship with um, nursing leadership and also uh, your, your colleagues or the other staff nurses. It really goes a long way for them to be able to cooperate with your project and to do the surveys when they don't feel like it. And last but not least, I was going to say that somebody told me that you really need to own your project. So study your project, ask a lot of questions, and really do great research. So. Well, everything they said, <laughs> plus, um, you know, just utilize your resources and um, don't be afraid, like, don't keep it, open up your mind. I mean, there's limited possibilities, so, and use your resources. So. Thank you so much, panelists. And now, how about some time for a raffle? <laughs>